Thanks for your kind affirmation, Pastor Buddy. Thank you. All right. Well, welcome to our First John series in Chapter Two. And before we jump in, why don't we take a moment um, to examine uh, our connection with our God who made us, and um, should we be at odds with our Creator? Uh, who gave us a purpose in life, and should we have sinned, we have a chance to, um, in silence, um, tell him in prayer, in the silence of our hearts, that we have sinned, knowing that, um, simply by doing so, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse our unrighteousness. And that's uh, thanks to what his son Jesus Christ did for us. God, thank you that um, you are consistent, um, and we know that you want us to be consistent too. That's we you know that's your message from <coughs> that you, you've created us to consistently do what is right, to love our brother, and to be obedient to you. And we know that you desire that consistency from us. And we thank you that even when. Uh, even should we fall short of that consistency, um, that you stay consistent, um, and that and we thank you that you always uh, you've made a way where we can always come back to you through your Son Jesus, um, and we acknowledge whatever errors and sins we've committed throughout this week or month, um, and our desire is for obedience and for us to sh and for you to show us. Um, that way of obedience and uh, create a new spirit and a new heart within us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Alright, so uh, Ray's not here, is he? No, unfortunately. So if I make up stuff about Ray, he wouldn't be here to <laughs> say otherwise, huh? Yeah. So Ray was uh, telling me, uh, you know what, I've had it with those quizzes, Pastor Fred, Let's, no more quizzes. And I was like, what? The quizzes are fun. He's like, no, they're not. It makes me think of school. <laughs> it just brings me back to school, and I hated school. <laughs> so I was like, aww. Okay. Well, what if we do a game show? I, oh, know. I like game shows. Well, what if we do Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Oh, yeah, that's my favorite. <laughs> so we're not going to do any quizzes. You're going to help me take the quiz because you know how I am. If we want to be American Millionaire, I get help from the audience. Oh, yeah. So there's no school today. There's no quiz. <laughs> it's just all game show. So game on. And there's the uh, who wants to be a millionaire. <laughs> and it's all out of John, 1 John chapter 2. Mm -hmm. Here it goes. So I have to answer the question in verse 1. It teaches that because we might sin, we need A. Is it faith? B. Is it repentance? C. Is it confession? D. Do we need an advocate? Or E. Just don't sin. E. D. 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 I see. I hear E, B, and D. 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 Okay, I heard advocate. Did I hear anything else? No. E. No? Just <coughs> C. C? Um, confession. Yeah, because there's that verse, right? Um, we don't just pray confession. Okay. Well, it doesn't say that. I'm going to go with. Um, I heard most D, so I'm going to trust the audience. Go with D. Oh, sweet. It's uh, D or E. I could have gone either way. Um, yeah, so. Uh, um, yeah, according to verse 1, though, it says, should we sin, we need an advocate. Now, why do I have just don't sin there? Um, I, one of the kids actually answered that for the quiz. And at first, I was like, um, I marked him wrong. But if you read verse 1, he says, I write these things so that you will not sin. So there is a sense in the bigger picture of the book 
um, kind of that John does want us to just not sin. Um, yeah, that's in the spirit of the book. Um, but then he also says, um, but if we should sin, we have an advocate with the Father. It's already taken care of. And because it's already taken care of, that's why C, confession, uh, would not fit um, the context of that set of verses. Mm -hmm. Because um, it's approaching it from the angle of it's already taken care of, and um, it's taken care of by the action of the Father and what the Son did on our behalf. Um, so anything that requires us to act um, is, we said last week, seek some kind of a bonus on top of the things already procured for us. Um, and the bonus is um, that we have forgiveness mm -hmm. and uh, we are have a cleansing of unrighteousness. And then we would explore, well, what does that mean? And why is that a bonus? All right. Um, and moving on, so we did this one already mm -hmm. um, about Hilosimos. Um, and we discussed in pretty depth that it is um, that solution and appeasement make for um, some user-friendly ways to fill in that blank. But Jesus is the solution for our sins, but Jesus is the uh, appeasement for our sins. And the focus in that discussion was, um, given John's audience, um, how technical or how um, common folk um, would he have expected them to be. And so my viewpoint is that um, those fit the category the best, uh, solution and appeasement. But the reason we have this question is we have lots of translations that throw atonement, propitiation, um, sacrifice. There's lots of concepts um, that get put, but for atoning sacrifice. And then if you ask uh, um, five people on the street what is propitiation, and then you might get five different answers. So um, appeasement, if that's like a word we never use, um, it's kind of like um, it helps someone change from being un uh, angry or unhappy to now happy. Um, or the analogy I like to use is it's like a cool down. Like I need to go get a drink of water. But it, it's not that I get a drink of water, it would be more like I'm handed a drink of water. Because um, usually in context, we don't appease ourselves. Um, someone appeases us. So Jesus was the he was the appeasement for our sins. He, you could vision him as like that cup of water. And then everything else, the nuts and bolts of how it all works, um, that goes under the hood. Um, and that, that's beyond the, the scope of John in this context, I believe. So that's why I leave it surface, surface level solution and appeasement. This is a review of last week. So if you weren't here for last week, then. Um, and you're curious, more curious about this, then come see me afterwards. I'd love to see you in on what you missed. All right. Um, here is question three. So we're now in the $10,000 area. Should I go for it? Okay, I'm going to go for it then. I'm not going to take the money. According to, according to uh, chapter two, the sure way to tell if we know Jesus is to examine what? Should I choose God's word? No. Our obedience? I, is it to examine our obedience? John's testimony? Our fruit? Or God's love? Bees. I hear lots of bees. Are there any others? A. A? Okay, God's word. Um, any more A's? A and B. A and B? Um, they won't let me choose the A and B. Uh, yeah. B. 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 Oh, D, our fruit? I heard mainly B's. I'm going to guess B. Yes! <laughs> our obedience. Um, and that's uh, in 1 John. Um, that is the sure way to tell if we know Jesus. Um, or the way it words it is we know that we have come to know him um, if we obey him. 
So, um, because if we're now obeying him and we weren't before, what that suggests is something is happening and taking work in our lives. So that would be the way to tell, according to John. So, um, do you have a question? I have a question. Just address, if you could, mm -hmm. uh, if you could address this issue. Let's say, let's say this half of the room, let's say we were all one or two years old in the Lord. And let's say that half of the room were, was eight, 10, 15 years old in the Lord. Mm -hmm. so talk about the obedience that would be normal for one or two year old in the Lord, six months in the Lord versus that side of the room in the sense that if we're looking at somebody and they're obeying as a three-year-old, five-year-old versus somebody... Did you Good, that's a great question. Action? How would obedience for a two-year-old or six-month-old look different than an obedience for a 30-year-old or a 70-year-old? And um, the cool thing, uh, this is my, this isn't something that John speaks to. Um, he doesn't go there, but this is just my perspective. Kind of a food for thought, take it or leave it. The way uh, God has seemed to structure the universe um, is it's filled with word pictures, analogies, and the very first thing we have as a child is a parent. Um, and we have a relationship with that parent. And there is a certain rule set of interaction. Um, and there is um, some behavior that's smiled upon and some behavior that is corrected. Um, so, there seems to be opportunities at all levels of development um, for obedience or selfishness. And that would be the best way I would know how to look at that. Um, and ultimately, there does need to be contact with God's truth um, in order to respond in faith. Or to fit the category of John's audience which is those who have heard the message. So that brings us to the audience of John. Who is he talking to? Is he talking to everyone, or is it a specific audience? Could that was you, a great question. Could you address that in those three categories that are in there, in Second John? Um, the three the categories? Children, young men, and... No, no because uh, then I'd be getting ahead. <laughs> so I like that you're anticipating. Thanks for a landline call. <laughs> That is no. That's for uh, that's not that's for prevent spoilers. Um, that's for hold your thought because you're on to something. Um, all right. Question four. Um, um, hey, should I walk away or uh, should I go for the next level, the thirty-two thousand? Go for it. All right. I'm going for it. According to First John two. A sure way to tell if we are abiding or remaining in Jesus is by, and that was familiar, but it changed. Now it's about abiding or remaining in Jesus. So the sure way to tell if you're abiding or remaining in Jesus is by A, having faith like a child. B, walking the way that he walked. C, remaining in fellowship. D, remaining in the light, or E, remain in God's Word. B. 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 I hear a lot of B, and I heard a C. So B is walking the way that he walked, and C is remain in fellowship. So I heard lots of Bs and Bs. But did I, did I hear someone else? B. B. So 60%. B and 40% C. I'm going to go with B. I'm going to go with majority. You've been, all right. It's, you guys have been so helpful for me as a majority walking the way that he walked. Is it always that way in the millionaire show where if you go with the majority, you get the right answer? No. Not always? Well, you guys are a great majority. So, yeah, he, uh, and that's what we have in, um, so who, whoever, claim, whoever claims to abide in him must walk the way that he walked, which is huge for us to have a model of walking and life living in the person of Jesus, um, because his model and life example unpackages into probably every question we could possibly ask. 
either directly or indirectly. Not to say that there's not some hard questions that the Bible doesn't address, but we have a model of life that forms our general um, perspective. All right. Thank you guys for getting me to... So I think if I can get this question right, then it holds the level, and I am guaranteed the 64,000. I'm going to go for it. In verse 7, verses 7 through 8, John speaks of an old and yet new command, or his beloved. Um, now, verses 9 through 11 appear to indicate that that command is to A, love God, B, love one's fellow brother, C, expel all antichristic brethren, D, remain strong in the Lord, or D, overcome the world. <clears throat> B, huh? That, there's already been so many Bs. Is it B again? Mm -hmm. I heard one C, expel the antichristic brethren. One another. And what? A and B, no. Oh, A and B? Uh, A and B. Which one's your favorite? Okay. What do you say? B. B. Okay. So the majority is B. Uh, I'll go with B, even though that sounds crazy if it would be B again. Oh, it's loved one's fellow brother. And guess what? Um, it's, it makes a lot of sense that, uh, Arnold, that you would say, well, what about A and B? Um, and later, work, he's going to explain. He's going to uh, explain. Yeah, no, John is actually going to explain. <laughs> Yes. He's going to relate the two together. Um, he's going to say, if you claim to have love for God, um, that claim could be uh, um, false. Because, yeah, I won't, I'll, I'll say uh, that's your homework. Um, why could that claim be false? I claim to love God, uh, and so I'm good. Um, and we'll find out, he says. No, not necessarily. And, um, or that, that, that our claim that we love God could be suspect, a suspect claim. And he'll explain why. Um, but we know for sure up to this point that love, loving one's fellow brother um, is the way of life that he prescribes in verses 9 through 11. And it seems to flow out of the command, the old and new command, because that's where it flows into there's a discussion on loving versus hating the brother. So he's addressing the brother. Yes. Loving the brother. I believe it's going to be chapter 3 or 4 where he ties love for God with love for the brother. I think it's chapter 4. So I don't want to jump the gun on that. Um, what do you got? Just for my own recollection, this is the first of the book of 1 John, right? This that, is 1 John. 1 yes. John. When he says love one and not love the brother, Mm -hmm. Where is it in the Gospel of John? Did he first state that? Oh, John good. So you're remembering, and you were there last week, right? Yeah. So you're probably remembering that last week we discussed yeah. this is an old and yet a new command. We took those questions already last week, mm -hmm. and we discovered that um, the, the old command seems to have likely have been given during that last meal. Um, the night when Jesus was arrested. Yeah. So he makes it clear that it is a command you've had all along since the beginning. But not only is it an old command, it's a new command because, might as well review it, what, what is it about it that makes it a new command? Do you guys remember? No. And you said uh, the model is Jesus Christ. No? Good, so it's a new command in that now we have a model of what it looks like. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, there was actually, believe it or not, three reasons um, given why it's a new command, and that's one of them. Um, we have a newness in the command because now we have a model a for the age. Oh, and now you're bringing in the age. Uh -huh. the it's a new command passing. because it's a new age. What were you going to say? The darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Great. It's, we're moving from the, the, the end of the dark age into the beginning of an age of light. And so it's a new command in the sense that it represents the new and coming age. So he kind of does a double-sided thing, uh, like flipping a coin. Um, we could look at the oldness of it, 
we've had it from the beginning, and the newness of it um, is walking us, entering us into a new age. Good. You guys are capturing the spirit of John very well. Mm -hmm. All right, great review, uh, and thank you for helping me um, pass this game show. Uh, all right, so now we're ready for John, the rest of John chapter 2. We are going to read verses... 12 through 29. How much have you won so far? I'm at 64,000 now, <laughs> thanks to your guys' help. So what if you miss a question? Does Rafi go up there and eat the new contestant? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> if that happens, you know, I'll be, a good you know, I'll be teaching yeah. up there. I like that. Um, yeah, we can make Rafi the new contestant. Yeah. Rafi and you, Steve, both together. <laughs> Oh, All right. My, my wife reminded me it's not a landline, it's a lifeline. So <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be rocking the lifeline. <laughs> yeah, they use it. I like it. So everyone at chapter 2 ready to go? If not, just listen as I read it. I'm going to start with verse 12 in chapter 2. Okay, so John starts to share. Now I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. And I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. And I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. And I write to you, dear children, because you have known the Father. And I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. And again, I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God lives in you, and abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. So do not love the world, or anything in the world. Because if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now, many antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One. And all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar? It is the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is the Antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father, but whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. See that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he promised us, even eternal life. I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you received from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real and not counterfeit, just that it, as it has taught you, remain in Him. Now And now, dear children, 
continue in Him, so that when He appears, we may be confident and unashamed before Him at His coming. If you know that He is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of Him. Alright. So, um, uh, reflect on what stood out in uh, the reading, and uh, if you would like to note any assurances or principles, or any promises, or any tensions, um, or any puzzlers or paradox, or any of those things of the sorts that we've been kind of focusing in on, um, and here's your chance to share it, and I will take about one to three observations before we move on. All right, what do you got? Um, verse 20. Um, you, but, but you have an anointing from the Holy, Holy One, and all of you know the truth. Good. So, once we become believers, we have been given the ability to be taught by the Holy One. Or the Holy Spirit, right? Yeah, we know that uh, um, those He is writing to have an anointing from the Holy One. Um, and it sounds like you're kind of asking, hey, what is that anointed one? Yeah, the Holy, exactly. Is it the Holy Spirit? No, no, the Holy One, I uh -huh. would imagine that would be the Holy Spirit, but the anointing from the Holy Spirit, did we get all of that during uh, conversion? Hmm. Or is it just so, this set of people he's talking to? It, it, now, yeah, now it could be, could be. Yeah. but if we were to come to that conclusion, it might be something we conclude from maybe right reading Paul's epistles. Mm -hmm. um, but is it, what, and what we want to focus on is what can we um, know about this from what we know of what John is sharing. Brett, the, the only thing I'm trying to get at mm -hmm. is, uh, you know how people throw the word, like, he's anointed, he's anointed, uh -huh. he's anointed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. anointing. I mean, you know, people the throw that word as if, uh -huh. you know, this guy, we're, this guy. we got a big vat of oil that we're yeah, sprinkling all over. Yeah, he's, uh -huh. he's anointed. Don't you call that a gift? I mean, people this people just throw the word anointing, anointed, all over the place. The Good. So here's our takeaway. Um, I'm glad that we took note of. It seems like that word anointing is popping up a bunch in this text. Yeah. And so now what we're gonna do, because uh, let's say we immediately make it the spiritual gifts, um, then we might be jumping the gun just as much as the one who says it's um, whatever they say it is. So that's what this book is all about, is having the discipline to slow ourselves down and see if it will first emerge from the text. Uh, and then if it doesn't, then we might have to go to plan B. Uh, and that's what makes this book one of the more challenging ones, is because the way John likes to talk and then we kind of have to piece it together. Uh, so more on anointing later. I like that that stood out to you. What stood out to me was uh, 21 and on, onwards, the truth. Uh, I write to you not because you don't know the truth, but because you know it and because you know lies of the truth. And then who is the liar but the Antichrist? Um, and I like how this time I was able to see what the truth is from John's perspective. That that's probably equal to... Jesus being the Christ, or people who say that Jesus is the Christ, um, and then the Antichrist would be somebody who denies uh, the Father and the Son. And I like how he said, nobody who has, who claims to be against the Son, or no one who denies the Son has the Father. So they go together. And then that's probably why he says, you guys know the truth. Because they, his audience are people who believe in Jesus as the Christ. So it sounds like there, you're noticing there's kind of a dualism, because we're talking about dualisms, between um, those of the truth uh -huh. um, and of God versus those who are in denial right. of God's Christ, right. denial of Jesus. And he's making the uh, point that you guys, I know that you guys are of the truth, 
because you got, I know that you guys uh, believe in Jesus as the Christ. Hmm. I wonder if so he is. knows uh, they are of the truth because, does it state that anywhere well, that he knows? It says because, but because he you knows it and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Mm -hmm. So he's kind of implying that they are not liars. Right? Because they're of the truth, as he said. Okay, so, um, yeah, so if you affirm Jesus as the Christ, then you would be speaking the truth. Whereas if you deny that Jesus is the Christ, you would be lying. in the category of liars. Yeah, I think that fits. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, Yeah, so, <clears throat> all right, um, so good, and we are going to um, raise the question, because we've been kind of looking at um, categories such or considerations such as uh, um, what we what can we know about the author and his purpose of writing? Um, can we know what can we know about the audience? Um, any background <coughs> assumptions? Um, what about the hero in this book? And what about the focus of this section? So again, I'll take uh, about one to three observations before we um, as we go through this. So the question would be, has anything developed even further as a result of this passage in any of these five areas? What do you got? Is the children in verse 1 same as children in verse 2? Is children in verse 1 the same as children in verse 12? That's a good question. and. Uh, Let's start by asking, well, what can we know of the children in verse 1, and what can we know of the children in verse 12? Let's we'll start there. What can we know about the children in verse 1? It seems like he's addressing the whole congregation. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's start with what can we know about those children, based on what he says, and from what we have from verse 1. What about sin? I heard the word sin. I have a question. Okay. Are, those, are the little children literally little or just young in faith? New in faith? Yeah, I have that question too. So before we uh, um, before we go too far with the unknowns, uh, let's see if we can know anything first. So what what can we what can we know in verse one? Uh, the audience, uh, <coughs> Mm -hmm. Well, let's start with verse uh, 1, because <laughs> you're jumping into verses 12 through 14, right? So let's just slow yeah, down. I know we want to figure it all out. The difference between the children. What was that? Yeah, what do we know about the children in verse 1? I think there are the, uh, the same. The little children in verse 1 and the little children in verse 12 are the same uh, that uh, John is talking to. Okay, so you think they're the same, so that suggests that you might have noticed something in verse 1 um, uh, that made a connection for you. I don't want to go shortcut. I think it's same degree. Um, um, probably, but um, I, yeah, I don't know, to be honest. But let's be serious about this. Let's yeah. examine verse 1, because if I'm urging you strongly over and over, to consider verse 1, it might be because there's some important details in verse 1. But like, what can we know about these children in verse 1? He's writing, mm -hmm. but they're not the same. Yeah, may not sin. Great. So these children, he wants these to be children who don't sin. Mm -hmm. and is there anything closely tied to that in that as well? Verse 12 because you're no, even like without going like still in verse one through two okay. in that region. But if anyone does if sin, anyone. but if anyone does sin, what? It's possible. It, it seems like it's still possible, and what? We have an advocate. And we have an advocate. advocate. And it's these children who have an advocate. So let's start with that foundation. Um, Whoever these children are, um, it seems that their path, their childlike path, is intended to be to take a path of not sinning. Um, but there's also that balance of if they do sin, that they're covered by an 
advocate. Okay, good. We need that foundation because now what can we notice in verse 12? So we assure them? Well, what's, yeah, good. What's the reassurance? If there is one. Um, that bears sins are forgiven for his name's sake? Good. So their, their sins are forgiven. Kind of sounds similar, huh? Mm -hmm. So it makes us wonder is he wonder if he's trying to reinforce um, a similar identity for those who are children from the way John lays it out. So we can know something about these children. They're meant not to sin. And they appear to be forgiven, covered by an advocate. And so when you said that um, I, they're the same or connected, um, I think you're right on. And we just needed to speak out how we know. So well done, everyone. We did that well. Um, so, good job. Um, just to, maybe you could address this, but when you have mm -hmm. little children that are told that you may not sin as there being a potential when we have this advocate. But yet in verse 12, it says because your sins are forgiven for his namesake, there's mm -hmm. a sense in which if you just took 12 by itself without knowing verse 1. Yeah. Somebody could jump on that and say because your sins are forgiven, you therefore are not in any kind of sin. You are in this state of sinless perfection and you don't have to confess your sins. You are covered by the blood of the Lamb. And I'm Mm -hmm. Addressing something I talked to you about last week, I, my wife and I heard a CD of somebody who's going around saying that we're covered at salvation to the point where there's no necessity of confessing sin whatsoever. That verse 12 seems to be his focus, that he's saying your sins are forgiven, so you know, do whatever you want to do, your sins are forgiven. Well, what if I, it says first time, well, now your sins are forgiven, just keep going what you're doing. Your yeah, you know, if we took the attitude of, uh, just do what you want to do, then it, um, it would be in tension with our the purpose for our new childly nature appears to be um, that we will not sin. And so we want to take note of that is these are children who are meant to quote unquote grow to be, um, and I'm kind of getting ahead of us, because he's going to return to ch in chapter 3. Um, we're going to reinforce well, what is this child meant to grow up into. But we get that hint already in um, chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, that these children are meant not to sin. So, yeah, and um, that assurance you were speaking of that seems like could be getting abused. Uh, um, it's a good thing that the way John writes it is he puts that assurance after laying out the foundations where... His game plan for his children is not to sin. Just so an aside, we're not. My wife and I aren't subscribing to tapes that have that information. But no, yeah, we know. My yeah. friend sent that to us, and we're someone else that has that to talk with them perhaps right. further. That there's some things here that aren't quite good. Yeah. So for the listeners, uh, Steve saying um, that he doesn't hold that we can just sin, um, but that these are others who might say that. All right, um, so we're going to come back to this at the end and uh, develop. But first, um, it's game on. So I have 64,000. All right, do we need the intense music? Oh my gosh, music, no. Right? Um, all right, based upon verses 12 through 14, I think you guys are going to help me out really good because you're like being hawks in some of this stuff. So based upon verses 12 through 14, which kind of audience does John not seem to have in mind? Alright, so should I choose A, those who have come to know God? No. Should I choose B, those learning about Jesus for the very first time? Should I choose C, those who have received forgiveness? Or should I choose those who have overcome evil? So three of those are right, and one of them doesn't fit. Which one doesn't fit? B. B. B? I hear B's again. Mm -hmm. Serious? Are you guys serious? Right. Final answer, B. You're right. Um, 
not those uh, learning about Jesus for the very first time, um, because there's uh, assumptions of their knowledge all throughout the book. They have uh, knowledge. So good. Um, all right. According to 1 John chapter 2, worldly love is focused on A, all the cravings, B, lustful sights, C, pride about one's life, or D, all of the above. All of the above. All of the above. That is what this little love is focused on. Alright, according to chapter 2, love for the world creates all the all the following problems. Um, except for one of these. So three of these are true, and one of them he doesn't say anything about. So A is um, worldliness competes with the world of I'm sorry, worldliness competes with the will of God. B. Worldliness leaves a person empty of the love of the Father. C. Things of the world will not last forever, but will pass away eventually. D. The world cannot make a person truly happy. C. 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 So C is not true. Is that a... No, that's true. Okay. Can you guys make up your mind? <laughs> Jump in here. I need your help too. <laughs> or else I'll just go with the majority again. <laughs> um, D. 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 Oh, D. I hear a lot of Ds. The world cannot make a person truly happy. Is it B? Or, or D? Um, worldliness leaves a person empty of the love of the Father. No, it says that there. Well, if, if, uh, if we're worldly, then the love of the Father is not in us. It says right there. Oh, so that would be true, that, that would, it would create that problem. Okay, so which one's the one that's not true? Um, so I hear a lot of Ds. Okay, I'm going to go with D. Um, that is, uh, except for the world cannot make a truly, person truly happy. Um, all right, you helped me get it right. What? And uh, that is the answer. The B. If we're worthy, yes, the love of the Father is not with us. Right. So that's the one that, that is, is a problem. So we're looking for the one that is not in the text. I mean, could so it, let's go back. Uh, sure. They say all things are for. Um, getting out of control. What was that? Could it be the love for the Father? In many of the translations, it says the love of the Father. Because he loves us first, right? That can never be used. Yeah, my, uh, way, my impression of the text is uh, it's pretty ambiguous. I think you're actually hitting on something. My memory of reading this text is it's ambiguous. Does yeah. uh, love, because uh, the text talks about how um, the love of the Father is not in us if we're, we're loving the world. So does that mean that? Um, so does that mean that God's love we're not enjoying it, like God's loving on us, or does it mean that um, we're not loving the way the Father would love? Um, it doesn't really clarify in what sense the love of the Father is not in us. It's ambiguous, and He might have done that purpose because He might have wanted it to be yes, both and. Um, so everything pertaining to fatherly love, heavenly fatherly love, that's not in any sense in us as long as we're going after the world. So that, and that is one of the problems that John brings out. That's why this question that is in here is, the moment we go after the world, what problems does it start to create? Well, it alienates us from God's will, because they're in competition. It alienates us from um, God's love. Um, and uh, the big practical problem is the things of the world will not last forever. Sooner or later, they're going away. The problem that he doesn't talk about is uh, the world cannot truly make us happy. That might not be true. It could be the case that the world truly could make us happy. 
it might meet exactly what we want. Um, there, there's nothing in the text that says it won't. And I've talked to people who say, yeah, I'm perfectly happy with where I'm at. And I'm not talking about a believer saying that. And I have no reason to doubt them. If they say they're happy and they seem happy to me, why should I question them? Mm -hmm. uh, now, part of this being in here is because, uh, have you guys ever heard someone start a message with, um, uh, no non-believer could be truly happy. You have to be a Christian if you want to be truly happy. Have you ever heard anyone say that before? Yep. Because mm -hmm. I've heard that um, before. And often it will be someone, uh, in the cases that I've heard it, it's usually like someone giving a testimony and um, they'll share how they used to be on uh, um, some drug or another or alcohol. Um, and then they felt empty and then they come to faith and now they feel happy. So they may, so therefore, because of that experience, they generalize upon the whole world that because I wasn't happy when doing drugs, no one could be ever be happy apart from Christ. Um, and uh, that's very presumptuous. Um, it, it might be possible to be happy apart from God um, for a time. And so that's, John is making it very clear um, what the problems are. The problem is not necessarily that you won't be happy. The problem is you're setting yourself up to be an, an enemy with God. And sooner or later, it's going to fall apart on us. Um, yeah, that, and then it, we probably won't be happy once the, the things of the world start to pass away. Once everything we take for granted starts to fade. Just as the entire world will fade. Um, and so, some people are not happy because they don't know the alternative. Sometimes a single person doesn't know the delights of marriage, having never been in a marriage. So there's the same kind of thing. People are like a, a Cornelius in the scriptures, where they are righteous, fearing God. You know, that kind of person that was the first Christian Gentile, and yet they are doing the things that are instinctively within the law, but yet they do that which is written on their heart, as the Book of Romans says. And they are happy in a generic sense, but they don't know the higher happiness that can be there within the realm of Christian truth. So, in a sense, they're happy where they're at. Good. So, yeah, they'd be happy where they're at. And so, if we're going to say they lack something, we've got to be very clear on what exactly we're talking about that they lack. Yep. Are we talking about um, promises God has made for us that give us a sense of peace, mm -hmm. such as uh, that... Um, we will become heirs of God or that we are children of God that could make me happy um, and that is something that um, not everyone has but now I'm getting clear on what exactly am I talking about so um, and that's not necessarily something that every person necessarily wants at any at every given moment of their life there's something that we hopefully appreciate but not every non-believer will necessarily want that um, they might just want to uh, their favorite soccer team to win. So, um, and then all you have to do is just uh, bandwagon and choose a team that always wins. So, and you'll be very happy. So, you know, lots of roads to happiness, but we've got to get clear on what we mean when we throw statements around and stick with those statements that John makes. Um, which is that um, worldliness leads to anti-godness. It creates a battle, and we'll be on the losing end at the end of the day. And that's the key issue. So, all right, what does it mean to be the last hour? So, A, it is now the hour for final judgment. B, it is now the hour for believers to be raptured at last, as in gathered up by Jesus. C, it is now the peak of night when Antichrists roam and multiply. Um, D, D, it is now the promised hour for all humanity to confess and acknowledge Jesus as Lord. Or E, it is now the last seven spoken of in the divine calendar of James Daniel chapter 9. C. C. Okay. 
I hear more full C's. No. no. I hear a no. Yeah. I hear a B. A B. No. So, first you guys were saying it's peak of night when Antichrist Rome and multiply, and then I heard B. D. And D. D. So I heard uh, it's D. the hour for believers to be raptured at last, and I heard someone say it's F. now the promised hour for all humanity to confess and acknowledge Jesus as Lord. F. And F uh, is not on the slide, so I couldn't uh, probably answer that. Uh, so help me win this game within the rules of the game. Oh, okay. So. C. And D and C. Antichrist. C. I hear C's again. They're starting to gain momentum. I see sign language C's. <laughs> so. Um, Alright, so and then someone says it is machine gunning from the same voice C, as though that makes it count for more people. Um, I overall heard lots of C's. Let's see if. C will get me to 128,000. It is C! You guys are hooking me up. Um, yeah, so what does it mean to be the last hour? Um, and what John is focusing on in this context is uh, that. Because uh, let's back up a step and recall that um, John's eschatology in this chapter, in chapter 2, is... Uh, um, I write to you a new command because uh, um, the darkness is fading and the new day is, yeah, the new light is already shining. So the night is coming to an end. And so that's the sense where it's the peak of night. Um, and he's warning us um, that it's the last hour and many antichrists are among us. So. We're almost there, but doesn't mean we're out of the clear. On the contrary, if anything, we need to be more on guard than ever in light of the deceptive spirits that are now going out the back. And now he's going to explain with question five, which asks, in this chapter, John defines the Antichrist as A, an evil spawn of Satan. B, the person who says he knows Jesus, but does not do what he commands. C, the ancient serpent that is called the devil. D, the anointed one of evil. E, anyone who denies that Jesus is the Christ. E, E, E. I hear A, E, I hear A, B, D, E. E, 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 I heard a D. E. 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 Okay, so anyone who denies. So E? Should I go with E? Yes. Uh, let's see what I have. Yes. 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 Okay. So B, B or E were like the two most famous <coughs> huh? Because he did speak in B. Those who say he knows Jesus but doesn't do what he commands is a liar. So you're on the right track, you're in the spirit of this. Um, but he explicitly says that, um, why do we, at the end of the day, why do we call them a quote-unquote antichrist rather than just simply a liar? Well, they're, what makes them an antichrist is that they're denying that Jesus is truly the Christ. So there, it's kind of like, really what they are in a sense is an anti-Jesus as the Christ. And so we have a term for that, and we use the term Antichrist. In this chapter. Uh, in this chapter, good. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Does John make a different definition for Antichrist somewhere else? You know, we, we take that word Antichrist. It's kind of similar to the word propitiation, mm -hmm. where we, we create this word propitiation and load it up with meaning. Mm -hmm. Antichrist is very similar where we take this word antichrist that sounds cool and then we load it up filled with meaning but if we go through like the books of the bible um, for example daniel uh, seems to speak of such a person but he generally speaks to him as a in, in imagery as a horn an evil bragging boastful horn and then paul speaks of what we identify as antichrist but he calls him the man of lawlessness. And then Revelation seems to speak of, of the one that we call the Antichrist, but he refers to him as a beast that comes out of the sea. Mm -hmm. 
things. So oh, I just gave a spoiler. Sorry so about that. he actually does say, uh, um, write the word Antichrist in Revelation because that's. What so he no, I'm not uh, sure that he used it. So what I'm getting at is uh, uh, my, the Bible uses all sorts of words. It appears that our favorite word has become the word Antichrist. Now, there is a word Antichrist. We didn't just make it up. John is using it in this context. And how does he mean to use it? He uses it to refer to someone who is anti the Christ, or the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. So when, once we start to load it with additional meanings, we're using it as a systematic theology term now, um, rather than using it um, with the focus that John has in mind. And part of the reason we that is is because we come to learn more and more about this person. He has many sides to him. He is an antichrist. He is a beast. He is a man of lawlessness. He is an abominator that causes desolation. He is uh, aligned with um, the devil. He has all sorts of things to learn about him. And just historically, people have found it the easiest to just refer to that person as the Antichrist. And all I'm trying to do with this is to say the way we throw the term around um, could be very different than the way Paul was throwing the term around. I mean, John. Mm -hmm. um, but just to be fair, mm -hmm. <laughs> we know what you mean by when you say the Christ, but yet, for as far as somebody who's just looking at this book, mm -hmm. um, in the sense we load up Christ calls us good for us. We, even yeah. the word Christ is loaded with meaning, and we talk about that in our second hour all the time. Yeah. Of what is the Christ loaded up yeah. with? And we talk I talk to the kids also. Um, How can you deny Jesus so, Christ if you don't know who the Christ is or what it is or why it yeah, is? Or... Good, yes. Susan's son Jonah and I had a great um, conversation about well, what is the Christ? Because yeah. people growing up in the church load it up the meaning to mean Oh, well, that's the Savior. But if you're from an Old Testament angle, um, with Messiah. the Messiah, I mean, literally, it's just anointed one, or yeah. the oil man. Mm -hmm. I'd call him the oil man if I'm going literally, because he's just anointed with oil. Um, and then when you look at what's significant about him, um, and he's someone who brings peace, he's someone who advocates for Israel, he's a conqueror, um, and he rules by the Spirit with righteousness, um, so all this salvation stuff that we put the focus on is until way later where they develop him in a new light in the New Testament. And usually when they speak of the man of salvation, they use terms like suffering servant um, or um, the, the one who was pierced in Zechariah that is very, um, is very veiled, very hidden. Um, and so that's another term great point, Steve, that um, even in the word Christ, we load it up with a modernized systematic theology that might look very different from the way a Jew um, at this at the time of the biblical times would um, load up that idea of the Christ. So, um, pre-Jesus it was loaded, very weighted in this one direction. Um, once the Christ came, it was very balanced, and then we've kind of balanced the pendulum the other way, where we ignore all the um, all the things. We just make it the Christ about what he does for the church, and forget about what he does for the world and for Israel. Um, we often forget about that angle. So he is he's very loaded. And that's why my, my preferred definition for the Christ is the one who has promised to set right all the things that have gone wrong. Because then I create a question, well, what are all the things that have gone wrong? And as we list those things that have gone wrong, whether it's in the world, within our own nature, within our own guilt, um, then the Christ answer, provides an answer to all those issues. Um, it's the whole package. The Christ is the full promise, not just the Savior for sins, because there's more than just sins. Uh, there's a curse that we're still under. Christ hasn't completed. Um, he has been 
promised to complete. So yeah, what do you got? Um, uh, before you ask your question, we yeah. have 338 looks like. Yeah, That's 331. It. So uh, we'll take the last question um, and then we will um, end because uh, we will not be able to um, do full justice to this chapter. Um, so I don't want to try to wrap it up when we can. What's that? I didn't win. Yeah, I haven't won yet. Um, but Rocky's not up yet. No, you're going to win. Yeah, that's what they do in Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, right? They put it off till the next night. What's I asked that question, question because mm -hmm. I think uh, it's important for us to remember that the same author can use the same word differently. Like in Second John, he uses the Antichrist for something else. Uh, he defines it a little differently as this, somebody who doesn't confess that Jesus came in the flesh. So even the same author used the same word, Antichrist, for different uh, meanings in different contexts. So some people might say, oh, John used this word, but they may, they may be different meanings. So that could be helpful for our own studies. Okay, so it sounds like what you're getting at is uh, John's own definition of the Antichrist could develop through the course of uh, um, the, the path of the book, just in the same way that uh, little children we've seen develops. Which is something that yeah. Steve was bringing up earlier, where he was saying you can't just focus on the fact that as children we've been forgiven. We have to also. Um, there was a prior statement where the big game plan for children is are to not sin, uh, and we'll find that out that um, as the little children were meant to grow into something. So more later. Um, so yeah, well. Um, you guys have been very uh, focused and um, um, very observant on uh, lots of the stuff in this chapter. Um, so I'm excited as we move forward. And um, why don't, since we're ending on this slide, um, I could conclude our focus or our principle <laughs> moving into the week to just keep in mind that uh, um, whatever life is throwing at us, um, we might not be too surprised, or we might not be too surprised about it when we consider that we're in the last hour. Mm -hmm. We're at, in the peak of night, so whatever challenges we're going through, whatever pressures to live differently than the way the Bible recommends that we live, but, um, that's natural. Um, and to say we're truly happy because we're Christians, that would be crazy because we're in the peak of night right now. We might not be very happy. Um, there could be depressing things going on. And um, what's more appropriate is to say we're in the peak of night. And our faith, our hope, is for that coming daylight. And in the meantime, um, we stay true to what we've heard from the beginning. We're going to develop that next time. What do we have? What have we received from the very beginning that we can remain in, so that we can combat the night, the night's time, and the deceit that we're bombarded with? So that will be our coming focus. And with that, uh, we will put it in prayer. Are we ask? For your help, um, acknowledging that you say we are at the peak of night, um, we're in the last hour, and uh, there are many um, deceitful um, forces among us. Um, there's worldliness among us uh, that entices us towards cravings and desires, and, um, and there are ideas out there, um, even challenging your son Jesus, um, that he truly is to Christ, um, that we might be discouraged by, um, perhaps messages saying our faith is not real, or um, just challenges to our faith. Um, and so we trust that you understand our predicament and that you will give us strength to live during the last hour and to Keep us fixed on your truth that you put in us since the beginning. 
Um, remind us of what we've been given, um, your hopes and assurances and promises that you've given us. Um, thank you that we have a future for your son, Jesus. Um, thank you that we are children um, uh, and that we're meant to grow up into something significant. We trust you for that. We trust you will continue to develop us um, as your children, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.